This afternoon we've got a, uh, a special uh, occasion here at the Australian National University uh, with uh, Steve Chu and uh, Steve uh, has agreed to have a, a conversation with us about his career in science, in government and uh, how one makes the transition between those two. So maybe Steve if we could start off with the science, you've clearly been a successful scientist in a number of fields and uh, obviously multidisciplinary research is, uh, is very important. Can you tell us exactly how you made uh, this uh, transition between disciplines and why this is a key aspect of modern science? Well, I made the transition uh, because I failed a lot of times <laughs> and I tried a lot of things. Uh, and, uh, but you want to move on and, and, and go on and do things. In terms of going into new fields, I, when I was a PhD student, uh, it took me three or four, looking at three or four different things before I landed on the parody non-conservation experiment with my right. advisor. Uh, and it, there was a beta decay experiment, there was you know, heavy ion experiment, there, there was a theoretical work. Our first project was actually a theoretical piece because um, uh, my advisor thought that I would be good in theory. Uh, whether I would have been good in theory or not, I love doing experiments. Mm. So if you consider even from a graduate career standpoint, uh, I was getting incompletes until I landed on something I cared about and thought was important. Mm -hmm. And then went going to Bell Laboratories, a number of different experiments in very different areas, anywhere from very fundamental physics uh, in that had direct ramification in high energy physics to condensed matter physics, then uh, positronium, laser cooling and trapping, uh, things of that nature. So it was uh, something started in graduate school that just continued in my career. Mm -hmm. Now, as I hopped from field to field to field, uh, what I was discovering was it was more fun. Mm -hmm. uh, I did spend in order, in order, uh, a large amount of time in laser cooling and trapping and atom interferometry, things of that nature. Right. Uh, but because that was uh, something that was new and for the first decade or two or three or four, it was a very exciting thing, as it is still today. Exactly. But, but what I also discovered, uh, beginning at Bell Laboratories, but making a conscious note of it when I arrived at Stanford, the same technology you can hold on, use to hold on to atoms, mm -hmm. you can hold on to biomolecules. Bio, bio mm -hmm. You can do these things in a way that could really revolutionize biology. So I said, hey, I need to get into this. I need to learn a little biochemistry, a little biology. So sort of entering the back door in the late 80s, early 90s uh, to get into this. And it led to more and more, I had an interest in biology, but had a technical introduction to contribute. But over the years, that became a larger and larger fraction of my work. Uh, by the late 90s, it was the majority of my work. Mm -hmm. in, and whereas the laser cooling and trapping was continuing, the biology became a bigger deal. The graduates from my group were uh, becoming very distinguished in laser cooling and trapping and atom interferometry, and so I was also running away from them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, and by that I mean they were excellent people and, uh, and lots of really smart people were moving into this over mm -hmm. the decades and said, well, Let's go into something else where it's fresh, where it's, there, there are very few people, it, it, there is nothing there. And so I had to move, I, I jokingly say, and I really mean this truth, mm -hmm. uh, I have to move on because the competition is getting too tough. Uh, but I should say in all honesty that in this interdisciplinary stuff uh, that borders between many fields, uh, some of the very best stuff, some of the most innovative stuff lies there. Mm -hmm. It's like when uh, X-ray diffraction meets biology, right. and crystallography and structure uh, and structural biology, uh, and the flourishing of an entirely new field. Uh, uh, when uh, laser cooling met atomic physics, met uh, many body theory, you see all of these things happening. Um, and so, so um, now I'm in going into biology and now medicine. Uh, but then, since becoming secretary of energy, I had an interest in batteries, and now I'm starting to collect work with batteries uh, for energy storage for electric vehicles uh, because it's too important uh, not to 
not to be involved in that. Exactly. And I know this uh, too, when, uh, when I was very young, I went to one of these Lindau meetings where Nobel Prize winners uh, mingle with students and they discuss uh, physics or whatever subject it is for that year. And one of the characteristics of the Nobel Prize winners that I met at that time was that they had moved on from their original field in which they won the Nobel Prize into uh, different fields. And, uh, and I noticed that you've done the same thing. You've moved from laser cooling and trapping, as you say, uh, for which you won the Nobel Prize, into, into biological applications of similar techniques. Is it the, uh, the fact that uh, you uh, have the freedom once you've won the Nobel Prize that allows you to do this, or is this just a, a natural continuation of, uh, of your interests? Uh, how, does, how does that uh, play out? It, no, as Because I, it's a characteristic of these Nobel Prize winners uh, that, that are at Lindau. Right. No, uh, many of the Nobel Prize winners, uh, including myself, moved on well before they got a Nobel Prize. Right. And indeed, if you look at the Nobel Prizes that have something to do with biology and medicine, a reasonable fraction of them were awarded to people who started a career in physics. Mm -hmm. So they had actually moved on. Already. Already. Um, and um, I started moving in biology in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I got a Nobel Prize in 97. Actually, some colleagues at Stanford told me in the middle 90s, they said, Steve, you're spending too much time in biology. You shouldn't do that. And I said, why not? Mm. And I said, they said, this one person said, because you have to leave your scent. You have a good chance at a Nobel Prize, but if you go into another field, you're gonna get it written out of history. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm sorry, I'm very excited about this, and, uh, and so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and so if you look at these Nobel laureates, they moved on after, but many of them moved on before, mm -hmm. and they constantly move. They, moving actually stimulates the imagination. You go into a new field, everything is new and fresh and exciting again, and, and, uh, that's, uh, and you need some courage to do that, especially mm -hmm. when you go from physics to biology or, yeah. uh, or, as a, or polymer science that I went into. You, you start from scratch. You mm -hmm. go to meetings, they don't, no one no, knows about you. Right. <laughs> but boy, is it fun to learn new things. Uh, and, and, and then all the tricks that you had from your old field, to whatever you can, you can import to the new field. Mm -hmm. And that's also very important because you look like a genius when you're not because you're using something that the old field knew about long ago. Mm -hmm. and, and you're just bringing it to a new area. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we've got a, a common background in the area of laser cold atoms and uh, we've known each other for a very long time. But maybe you could say something about the relationship that you've had with the Australian National University over the years. Well, I, I think I came here first in 1991. I gave a series of lectures here. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you invited me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I came back again in 2005 to, uh, to Australian National University uh, when they were celebrating, as was the rest of the world, the year of physics. Mm -hmm. I've been back to Australia a number of times uh, for you know, laser spectroscopy conferences, other things, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, a long history. Good, good. And uh, we've noticed during this time that uh, you've made the transition from being a scientist to somebody that engages strongly with politics and government. And uh, maybe this doesn't suit every scientist's uh, uh, interests or uh, capabilities, but tell me how you made the transition and what it, what it meant to you to, uh, to actually engage in an area well outside your original sphere of, uh, of expertise. Well, actually, I didn't consciously set out to get into politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I never campaigned for anyone in my life. Mm -hmm. I never lended visible political support to anyone in my life. Um, I was very happy being a professor when people at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory said they were interested in having me throw my hand in the ring to be director of this large national laboratory. Mm -hmm. This is um, 4,000 people, a budget of uh, half a billion dollars uh, to 0.6 billion dollars uh, and at first I said I'm not interested I'm very happy where I was at Stanford uh, they asked me again I said I'm really not interested so you know but thank you very much mm -hmm. and finally my old boss at Bell Laboratories who was then the director of Lawrence Berkeley said look Steve if there's a five percent chance that uh, you would consider just come on over visit talk talk to us get interviewed that's all we're asking. If it's not a 5% chance, don't bother wasting our time, don't mm -hmm. bother wasting your time. 
So I began to think, all right, 5% chance, maybe there's a 5% chance. But it was a little bit more. It was, I had been already concerned about climate change mm -hmm. and knew that Lawrence Berkeley Lab and any major research organization, a laboratory director is different than a president of a university. You're actually the boss <laughs> yes. in a laboratory. Uh, and so I said, if I could get these first-rate scientists to shift their attention a little bit, not by ordering them, because you're the boss, but by engaging them and saying, this is an exciting challenge, that there will be essentially Nobel Prizes in the mm -hmm. science that comes out mm -hmm. of how you transition to a sustainable world. And if I can excite them, that's much better than just giving talks about it. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'll show up. Uh, and then uh, they offered me the job. <laughs> now, uh, so when I showed up, you know, people were doing a little bit of it, but they said, well, we don't know anything about energy. I said, well, I don't know that much about energy. It's okay, we'll teach ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's like me going into polymer science, me going into biology. It's, it's okay, we'll learn. We'll, we'll meet privately and do things. We'll have little uh, workshops and we're just gonna teach ourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that actually worked and it was gathering enthusiasm. There was no guaranteed funding for this, but people could recognize that this could be really exciting, really interesting science, multidisciplinary. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I thought, okay, after about five years, I'll step down, I'll go back to my lab and have done my duty. And uh, then in mid-November of 2008, I get this phone call that says, uh, the president-elect would like to talk to you about a very important job. And my reaction was, well, thank you, but I'm not really interested. <laughs> but how important? <laughs> and um, as so I flew to Chicago and in a floor rented in some office building, uh, I sat, was waiting, uh, and the president-elect, president, -elect, president uh, then President elect Obama comes into the room alone. Uh -huh. It's in a hot room. It's, you know, he's from Hawaii, so he likes heat. <laughs> and um, so he just walks up and says, A lot of people say that you should be my Secretary of Energy. Uh -huh. To which I said, Who are these future former friends of mine? <laughs> he just didn't he just didn't react to that <laughs> and so we just started talking, you know, what do you think about this? He was asking me what I think about this, what I think about that. Mm -hmm. Of course I knew uh, what he thought about energy, clean energy, climate change, mm -hmm. all these other things. Mm -hmm. and, um, and a couple weeks later he said, we'd like to, uh, you, we'd like to, you know, we have to vet you, we have to do all these other things, but we'd like you uh, to be the next Secretary of Energy. And so uh, at that point, hey, if the President-elect says, <laughs> we like so uh, I wasn't going to say no, um, and so that's how I got dragged into politics. Right. right. Uh, I'm uh, I'm not a politician. Those who who know me well, uh, you know me well, uh, but uh, there's not really a political bone in my body. I'm trying to make the right choices for the United States, for the world, based on science, based on data, based on uh, many many things, and also based on. Um, uh, what would be good for the economy as well. These mm -hmm. things are not at cross swords with each other. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so that's how I got drawn into politics. Uh, I see. Uh, and, so and quite by accident, if you will. And, and so from that experience that you've had over the last uh, four and a half years or so, uh, what, what are the things that you've learnt the most during that time? And, and, and would you recommend it for somebody else who's a scientist and maybe has had their career move in a direction that enables them to make this transition? Do you think it's a, it's a good thing for scientists to do and to contemplate yeah. doing? Well, let me ask, answer the last question first. Mm -hmm. um, if you uh, think you can make a difference, uh, it requires commitment, mm -hmm. it requires a thick skin, mm -hmm. it requires an inner compass uh, that I would recommend it. Uh, you also, as a scientist, one would have to be able to explain things at any level. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not sound like you're being condescending. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but but uh, having done that, uh, some of the best scientists I know can explain the science truthfully and accurately yeah. at any level, from, from the 
deepest experts to, to people who are not really scientists or may not even have an interest in science, mm -hmm. uh, but to show them that, you know, why do we think what we is, how can that be useful to society? Mm -hmm. so, so I would say absolutely um, mm -hmm. that uh, governments need more really good scientists. Um, not as a career, it doesn't have to be a career. It could be two years, it could be four years. Mm -hmm. And then go back to being a scientist, but you can mm -hmm. serve your country, you can serve the world sure. in this capacity. So absolutely, um, but y it, it takes a special kind of person that's willing to put their career on hold. Mm -hmm. But it turned out the people I brought in with me, it was career enhancing in a different way, in an unsuspected way that I never appreciated. Mm -hmm. It's not, career enhancing normally in politics means you get hired in a law firm or an investment place mm -hmm. because now you know a lot of contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, scientists don't want to do that, they just want to go back to doing science. Mm -hmm. But working in the Department of Energy and getting a much more complete picture of what it takes to, from scientific discovery to innovation to actually helping policy uh, actually nudge private investments in the right direction and what it takes for it to become a self-sustained successful deployment is something I would never have learned uh, as an academic scientist or even mm -hmm. director of a national laboratory. That actually helps me reframe what I think about in research. And so in that mm -hmm. respect, and, and the colleagues I brought in who have now gone back to being professors also realize, oh my gosh, I have a different perspective. It's a better I perspective. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Um, uh, so there are many, many things I think that um, I could say would be good, for, but you have to have a thick skin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, now, uh, I think, particularly in the energy sphere, we've seen a lot of uh, important developments recently, and uh, President Obama has been at the centre of a number of these. We've seen the, mm -hmm. the standards that are being uh, set now for emissions in the US, and we've recently seen the announcement with uh, the President of China that uh, the US and China will enter into a, an agreement to uh, reduce emissions, and this is a, an enormous boost to momentum for uh, an agreement in Paris uh, in a year's time. So. Where do you think uh, the political landscape is heading, uh, particularly uh, in relation to doing something about climate change through energy? And uh, what role do you think uh, the, uh, the United States has to play in this? Well, first, I agree with you completely. That was really a historical moment. Mm -hmm. Because you have a developing country, albeit a very developed developing country, mm -hmm. but with huge growth in energy because people were coming out of poverty, huge concerns about how do you have this, keep the momentum of growing prosperity, but do it in a much cleaner way, mm -hmm. being for the first time willing to say, we're going to cap our emissions 2030, maybe sooner if we can do this. Uh, we're going to be investing by 2030. 20% of our energy will come from renewables, mm -hmm. uh, and et cetera, et cetera. The United States saying, no, we're going to double down on our pledge, our peak carbon emissions was 2005 and by 2030 we're going to go down by a significant amount, much further than was said in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a big deal for a couple of reasons. These are the two largest carbon emitters. Yes. And they are the two largest economies in the world. Yeah. And for one to say we're going to jointly pledge this. We don't need 192 nations to be mm -hmm. part of an agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to wait for 190, 192 nations, it's like waiting for 50 states to decide mm -hmm. something <laughs> in the United States. And so what happened in the United States, the states started moving. Yeah. And 78% of the economy of the United States now have mandatory renewable portfolio standards. A certain mm -hmm. fraction of the energy has to come from wind, solar, or other renewables. Mm -hmm. Uh, California, 32% by 2030. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Texas, huge renewable. If you look at the economy of the United States and the majority of states in the United States, they're moving. The federal government will be the last to come into place. Mm -hmm. I think I'm hopeful for an international agreement, but if you think about what is happening, I think you know, a large part of Europe is moving. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you have Europe. You have the United States now, you have China say, we're going to move. This is too important. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, this is not going to wreck the economy if you do it right. It's mm -hmm. going to be a plus in the long run. Because I truly believe 
not within 50 years, but within 10 or 20 years, renewables is the low-cost solution. In Australia, quite candidly, I think solar is already the low-cost solution. Okay. And in many parts of the United States, we are now discovering solar and wind are cheaper than anything except natural gas in the United States. Mm -hmm. Natural gas in the United States is one quarter the price around the world. Okay. Yeah. And so if you get wind being competitive with natural gas in the United States, virtually any other part of the world, uh, it's, it's a slam dunk if you have good wind resources. Mm -hmm. Australia has good wind, it has good solar, it has Indeed. a lot of land. Indeed. And so you have an incredible opportunity to go to a low cost solution. Uh, the United States has this incredible opportunity. This is not about taking a financial hit. This is about doing things intelligently mm -hmm. and, and saying, hey, you know, whether the climate change, the climate change issue is really there, but this is the smart thing to do no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. Some people say, though, that Australia, because it's a small country, uh, probably only contributes a couple of percent to the global emissions, uh, really can't make that much of a difference, uh, even if, uh, you know, we adopt uh, renewables and other, and other mm -hmm. policies. Um, but we are one of the world's largest energy exporters. So do you think that there's some sort of a moral responsibility on Australia to, uh, to do the right thing in terms of the climate and the environment uh, as a as a key player in the energy sphere, or do you think uh, that we are just a small country and that uh, our opinion uh, doesn't really rate for very much in the world scene? Well, in terms of population, you are a small country, but your opinion does count. Uh, you can be Denmark and say, hey, we're a small country. Mm -hmm. You know, why do we care? Yeah. You know, why are we 30% <laughs> renewables? Uh, you can say, uh, for each country in Europe, you can say exactly the same, but they don't. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and it, when the first year uh, when I was Secretary of Energy, uh, people who didn't want to move in that direction said, why should the United States move in this direction? Why should we invest in renewables? China's not doing it. Says, no, China's investing in it. They, you know, they're investing in solar factories, they're investing, and they're investing in it for deployment in their home country. Right. And in my last year, uh, people in Congress were asking me, what's happening? We're falling behind in China. <laughs> uh, in, in developing the technology, this is no, we're not. Okay, China was the largest installer of renewable 2013 mm -hmm. yeah. in their own country compared to the rest of the world. They'll be the largest installer in 2014. Mm -hmm. They also see this as an economic opportunity internationally, mm -hmm. but they also see it as a climate imperative mm -hmm. and a pollution imperative. Mm -hmm. And so, but the people just went on to the next excuse. Mm -hmm. Well, why should we put a price on carbon? when China's not going to do this. Well, I think China's going to put a price on carbon before the United States, mm -hmm. federally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they would say, well, why should we limit our carbon emissions when China's not doing this? Mm -hmm. And so they're going to just go from one reason to another. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, with regard to your other question subliminally is the following. If you are a country rich in fossil resources, where a major part of your income mm -hmm. is mining, extracting those fossil resources and exporting them, one has a conflict. It's just a fact of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so you look at those countries that where, where a large part of your internal generated wealth is coming from extraction industries like oil and gas and coal or minerals, mm -hmm. uh, there's going to be an inherent conflict between people making money doing this, including your country, and, yes. and, and, and saying, okay, we need other things. Uh, and so if you look mm -hmm. down the list of countries which are having problems, uh, you know, Australia is one, Canada is conflicted, mm -hmm. Russia is conflicted, mm -hmm. the United States is conflicted. Uh, this is not a big surprise. Mm -hmm. In the end, I think you're gonna have to realize that, as I said, number one, in terms of generating electricity, renewables will be the low cost solution whether it's 10 years or 15 years mm -hmm. or whatever, it's, it's going to be a low-cost solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, transportation fuel, a little bit harder. Uh, but in the end, that too... It will be electrified. It will be electrified mm -hmm. uh, because battery progress is stunning mm -hmm. uh, in the last 10 years. And in the next 10 years, I think it will be even more stunning. Mm -hmm. And so all these things point to this is the way we do it in the future. And I used to, when I was Secretary of Energy, I used to try to explain to people, uh, using an analogy with Wayne Gretzky, 
the mm -hmm. great uh, hockey player. Yes. Uh, uh, really, arguably, one of the best hockey players there ever was. And he was a pretty skinny person, yeah. right? Yeah. But fast. Yeah. And you say, how, you know, what made you different than all the others? And he said, I skate to where the puck's going to be, not where it's been. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I tried to explain, and I think it got some partial traction. Look what's happening with the technology. Look what's happening. Yeah. You want to position yourself to see well, this is where the world is going. This is what science and technology is going to give us. Not, I wish it were like it was 50 years ago and 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and so there is a recognizable conflict mm -hmm. uh, and all these countries, Australia, the United States, all the ones I named have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, um, it is the future and there is the climate change issue. Indeed. <laughs> and so for a number of reasons, uh, this is where you have to go, uh, you have to diversify, you have to clean it up and put the real cost of fossil fuel, you know, put the real cost onto fossil fuel you can invest in R&D. In the end, the private sector is going to decide mm -hmm. what to do. Uh, but um, just think of it this way. You're a chemical factory, mm -hmm. and you're dumping sludge into the river, into the lake, into the ocean. All right? And hey, the cost of doing business is it's much cheaper not to treat the polluted pollutants. Just dump it in. Except if you're downstream. The people downstream find it very costly. Mm -hmm. Okay? This is partly a government function. You can't let the upstream polluters affect the downstream people for the good of the entire community. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to deal with the pollution before it gets into the river or into the air. And this is one of the things, uh, because in the end, society will pay for the cost of what you're doing. It's much cheaper to do it at the source. And it's, it's part of the government to say, this is the real cost to our society. You know, there's indications, strong indications, that the climate weather patterns, let me call it, not call it climate, the weather over the last 30, 40 years, as I've discussed, is changing. Mm -hmm. There are more extreme weathers, more serious droughts, as a multi-year drought in Australia. Mm -hmm. More funny typhoons that didn't ought to have been there before are coming to pass. Statistically, uh, it's happening. The climate modelers can't predict uh, in any detail whether there's a drought or a hurricane or a tornado. Mm -hmm. uh, they did say that the weather will become more unpredictable and more unstable, but we sure. can't actually tell. Okay, But whether they can or not, you just watch what's happening. and You look at the rise in temperature and you look at what's happening over not the last couple of years, but over the last three or four decades, it's rising out of the noise. Mm. This might not be an accident. I don't mm. think it's an accident. Mm -hmm. the, most of the science say this is not an accident. This is what we think is had was going to happen. Exactly what happens, the climate scientists say we can't really tell. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge risk factor, and we're beginning to see the manifestations of this risk becoming reality. Mm. Indeed. And so there's another thing that we've got to digest. Indeed. And with that uh, future-looking note, uh, I think that's uh, a good point to finish. And uh, it's been interesting over the years to, uh, to have you come back to the Australian National University and uh, indeed see somewhat of a parallel in the development of our careers. And uh, wonderful to see the, uh, the uh, very important role that energy has played and you've played it in the development of energy policy over the years. And uh, the Australian National University Energy Change Institute, thanks you very much for visiting us and okay. giving us the benefit of that experience. Well, thank you. It's great to be back, and thanks for inviting me. And, uh, you know, I wish you all the best of success, both in atomic physics and in energy. Good. Thank you very much, Steve. Okay. Great thank to you. see you. Good.